I'm really excited to announce the first keynote speaker. She's adorable, ladies and gentlemen, Linda Liukas. Uh, Linda is an internationally acclaimed speaker whose past clients include, for example, Google, Nokia, Siemens, and Wired. Linda is also a software programmer, a best-selling author, and illustrator of Hello Ruby. So let's say Hello Ruby and welcome Linda on the stage. Welcome. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, my name is Linda, I'm a mediocre programmer, I'm an illustrator, I'm a children's book author, I'm a business school dropout, an honorary doctorate from Tampere University, and this is the thing about us humans. We contain multitudes, we can be many things at the same time. Computers are binary, they can be one or zero, on or off, pass electricity or don't pass electricity. But we humans can be many things and that's kind of the topic of today's talk. I started my career from this one premise, the idea that if code is the new lingua franca, if our kids are going to learn Chinese, English and JavaScript as their first foreign languages in school, instead of grammar classes, we ought to be teaching them poetry lessons. And what I mean with that is the idea that in the same way we don't learn a natural language only by conjugating irregular verbs, we learn a language by speaking it, by singing it, by reading, by writing. The way we teach programming and code is pretty limited. And I, for once, when I was practicing programming uh, for the first time when I was in my early 20s, I would read through these computer science books and they would be horribly dull and grey and full of text. And Ruby was the first language I fell in love with and I was really excited about the language and its opportunities, but the textbooks and the ways we taught were boring. So every time I would run into something I didn't understand, like what is object-oriented programming or what is garbage collection in mobile development, I would start to doodle these little girl characters, Ruby characters, in the margins of the computer science books. And that's how the story was formed, literally in the margins of the books. But something interesting happened in my brain at that point, where in the past you know how there's people who see numbers as colors. I started to see the world of technology as stories. And I thought, huh, if Apple was a character, it could probably be the snow leopard who's beautiful but doesn't want to play with the other kids because they are too messy. It only likes well-designed, beautiful things. And, and, and if Linux was a character, it would be the ruthlessly efficient penguin who gets stuff done but is a little bit hard to understand at times. And I go to my mom and say, Mom, I want to drop out of university and I want to write storybooks about the world of software. And she says, that's a horrible horrible idea. That sounds like a Soviet propaganda book from the 1970s. Why on earth should kids understand how big technology companies think and what kind of values drive them? Well, here's the thing. Religions barely reach billions of people. Countries barely reach billions of people. But big technology companies like Microsoft or Alibaba or or Rakuten, they reach billions of people on a daily basis and it matters what kind of people and values we have inside these companies. And no one was really telling these stories about the world of software. And even though we live in this beautiful age of learning to code, there are so many ways of doing it from these puzzle-based activities of code.org to the open-ended playground of Scratch, no one was telling stories. And that was surprising for me because, first of all, I learned uh, to love Ruby as a programming language through this epic storybook called Wise Poignant Guide to Ruby. Anyone read that? It's, it has like really trippy stuff with foxes and, and <laughs> so forth. And even more profoundly, I think stories have always been the way we humans have understood ourselves, understood each other and understood the world around us. And today, my job is not to be a programmer, it's not to be an illustrator, it's not to be an author, it's to combine all these three things and write storybooks for kids between six and nine years old about the world of computer science. And these books have been published in 25 languages, which speaks volumes about how different pathways into computer science are needed in today's world.
Instead of, instead of only writing about code, I actually write about computer science at large. So about coding and computational thinking, but also about how computers work, how computers talk to each other, what are networks and internet. And the last book that came out in Finnish this fall is about machine learning and AI and what should six-year-olds understand about this world. And even though often I'm sort of pegged as someone who um, teaches kids to code, in reality what I think is I prepare kids for a world where more and more of the problems around us are computer problems. And for most people, the misconception about our industry is that computer scientists spend time studying the computer. And it's an easy mistake to make because when you think about a physicist, they study the physical world. When you think about a biologist, they study the biological world. But a computer scientist, they use the computer to study the big problems in the world and even sometimes to solve them, those of energy or education or health or nutrition. And that's why computer scientists matter so much and that's why it's a skill that we ought to be teaching to a much more diverse group of people than currently. One of my favorite quotes from a uh, computer scientist comes from Edgar Dijkstra, who says that computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. It's about thinking skills, about problem-solving skills. And I think this is what we inherently know, but for so many other people, computer science is about the syntax of coding. And that's a misconception I think we ought to change. So how do we do that? I think first through stories and second through reinventing the computer science curriculum we teach. And how do you then use stories to teach these skills? Well, let me introduce to Ruby. She is six years old, completely fearless, very imaginative, a little bit bossy. And when Ruby's dad tells Ruby, hey Ruby, you're running late from school, dress up really quickly, Ruby does dress up, but she leaves her pajamas on because dad didn't specifically tell her first to take the pajamas off. Yukihiro Matsumoto, by the way, is not the dad of Ruby in this world. Uh, he's someone else. And then when Ruby is told that, hey Ruby, your room is a mess, clean up all the toys. Ruby cleans up the toys, but she leaves the pens and papers on the floor because, come on, Dad, pens and papers are not really toys. And even though it's a story, the kids who read stories like this, they learn something very profound about how to speak to a computer. You need to get very exact commands. Commands need to happen in the right order. Naming things is important, like all software developers know. And then you need to take into account all kinds of situations that the computer might run into. And the most important thing, I think the most valuable part of your job and the attitude I would like the rest of the world to understand is the idea that even the biggest problems in the world, they are just tiny problems stuck together. And that's the spirit of software engineering I would want the rest of the world to see. So with that in mind, I decided to design the A, B and C of computer science curriculum for the next generation. And A, of course, is for algorithm. Algorithm is a funny word. When we adults, and especially the non-technical adults, think about the world algorithm, we think about finance and we think about Facebook and there's something scary and squeamish about it. But kids really love the word algorithm. It feels big and bold in their mouth. They think it's an adult word and they know that an algorithm is just a step-by-step -step sequence to solve a problem. And often we start with the kids by doing this activity where the other kid is the programmer, the other kid is the computer, and the programmer's role is to instruct the computer on how to wash your teeth. And it takes a few rounds and a lot of laughter and a lot of mistakes, and the kids learn uh, to understand the pain points of a programmer. For instance, did you remember the toothpaste? Did you remember to take off the cork of the toothpaste? What if there is an electricity breakdown in the building? And they start to have empathy towards all of the hurt a programmer needs to go through while creating these instructions. They also learn something very profound about how programmers work together. You are not coding alone in front of your computer. You have this community around you that you're supposed to be interacting and working with. They learn about something about debugging, how uh, you need to be really persistent when coding and find out the mistakes and no one writes perfect code at the get-go. And then finally, 
they learn something very profound about creativity. Because if I ask the kids to perform their algorithms, odds are there's 30 or 40 different kinds of algorithms for toothbrushing. Kind of lower level approaches and higher level approaches. Some are elegant, some are sloppy. But all of them kind of do solve the problem. And that is, I think, one of the beauties of programming. Uh, in math, you, especially in the younger years, you have one way of solving a problem. In programming, you can have a multitude of different ways. So an algorithm, it's like a cupcake recipe. You specify steps of sequences to make cupcakes. You can make one cupcake with the recipe, but you can also make a hundred or a hundred thousand cupcakes. By swapping the different ingredients, you can make different kinds of cupcakes. When you give instructions to a friend on how to find your uh, home, that's an algorithm, especially if the instructions are any good. But these kinds of examples, they usually make people feel like, oh, that's not the algorithm I'm thinking about. It must be something more mathematical, something more theoretical. So the way I explain an algorithm is like this. I show the kids a picture of five numbers and I ask them to put these in order of magnitude. And it roughly takes the kids 10 to 20 seconds to do this. But with these numbers, it takes a little bit longer. And with these numbers, it burns even more longer. And first of all, I say to them, these are the kinds of tasks you don't want to compete with a computer. Computers will be always better at organizing uh, big chunks of numbers in order of magnitude far faster than a human ever could. But the computer still needs instructions to do this. And that's an algorithm someone wrote in the past. It needs a strategy on how to approach a problem like this. So the way a computer would, for instance, approach a problem like this is this. It would compare 1 to 56. It would say 56 is bigger than 1. It would move on to the next pair of numbers. It would compare 56 to 4 and say, hmm, let's swap these around. It would move on to the next pair, 56 to 70. It would say, this seems okay. 70 to 20, let's swap it around and let's move all the way to the beginning and start this thing over and over again. And this is called a bubble sort algorithm them a really famous sorting algorithm from the I think 50s or 60s that someone wrote in order for a computer to solve a problem like this. Again, this is not the algorithm that keeps us awake, especially the non-technical people. They say that's all fine and fun, but that's theoretical. What about the world of real algorithms? So then we play a game with the kids, which is kind of like find where's Waldo type of a game. Um, where is the algorithm hiding in a search engine? And I show them a picture of a search engine and I ask, where can you spot an algorithm? And the kids think long and hard and they say, maybe the ads. And I say, yes, the ads are shown to you by an algorithm that takes into account your demographic data, your search history, everything relevant it can learn from you to showcase you the right kinds of ads. And the order in which you see these search results, that's also governed by an algorithm that someone someday wrote and tweaked and made better all the time. What about a social networking side? Where can you find the algorithm here? Hmm, the ads, the kids say at this point very bravely and strongly, I say yes, but also the kinds of updates you see. Because you see someone wrote an algorithm here that tries to maximize retention, how many times people come back to the site, how long a time they spend on this site. So they look for updates that keep you coming back to the site. So if there's a boy whose Facebook profile you go to several times a day, the algorithm spots that and tries to surface his updates multiple times a day. And then finally, I show them YouTube. And I show them, um, and, and at this point they are already pros, they say, oh, uh, the ads, those are defined by an algorithm. And the next videos, those are defined by an algorithm too. And then this is where the scary stuff happens. Because if many of you might have kids already, you know how there's some like really weird content surfacing on YouTube right now for kids that seems like it hasn't been designed for a human, it's been designed for an algorithm. Things like surprise Play-Doh, eggs, Peppa Pig, Pogoya, Stamberkats, Minecraft, Smurfs, this kind of weird Eastern European like content factories that crush out this content that is clearly not done for humans, it's done for algorithms. And of course the reason for this is that there is no way a human can go through all of the content that is being uploaded every minute to YouTube, 400 hours of video every one minute. And we need an algorithm. But the world where we start to design content that is not done for six-year-olds, it's done for algorithms, is at least in my opinion a pretty scary world. And that's why we need to open up these concepts, make them visible at multiple different levels. 
And this is nothing new for pedagogists. I'm a little bit like disappointed and sad that there is not this interplay between industries and research, and especially the education research world, because there's so much knowledge available already in the 60s and 70s. Jean Piaget, a really famous constructivist theorist, said that you can't teach an entirely organized intellectual discipline only by offering pre-organized vocabularies of content. And that's what we often do with computers science. We need to ground the learning in action. And I bet there's a lot of you who experience this joy of learning through play when you were learning first computer science and coding. And we're taking that away if we're only teaching the word algorithm through explaining that an algorithm is a step-by-step -step instruction to solving a problem. We need to be a little bit more ambitious than that. And speaking of play, there's actually more to that. I spoke with some of the people who understand play best in the world, and those people come from Lego, from Denmark. They have this wonderful non-profit research wing that has been constructing research for the past 40 to 50 years on different motivations of play. And very roughly they say that play comes in three ways or three motivations. There's achievement-based motivation, there's social motivation, and there's immersion motivation for play. But for some reason, whenever we talk about technical skills, whenever we talk about coding skills, we often talk about only the achievement level of play. We talk about domination, numbers, optimization, challenging other, gamification of systems. Whereas in reality, everyone here knows that there's so much more to programming. There's the joy of finding and giving support to one another, of finding and exploring new ways of solving a problem and at least for me uh, the perennial joy of escaping my real life <laughs> problems when, of, like, um, when, when working on a problem really, really, really deeply. And taking into account all these different aspects and motivations of play I think is key when we're recruiting and trying to attract new kind of talent to this industry that for an outsider seems very dominated by a certain type of a person. And it requires us as an industry to ask questions that we don't like asking. It requires us to uh, be emphatic towards people who have a different style of learning. So whereas in the past a computer science professor might ask as an exam question, what is a loop? Define to me what a loop is. I think a far more interesting question, especially for a six-year-old, is how does a loop feel like? So that's how we practice the concept, the very abstract concept of a loop with the kids, by having a dance party. Ruby's favorite dance movement is clap, clap, stomp, stomp, clap, clap, and jump. And we practice a for loop by repeating this sequence of movements five times. And we practice a while loop by repeating the sequence of dance movements while a condition is true. So while I'm standing on one leg, the kids keep dancing. And then as homework, they get the until loop, where you repeat the dance sequence until a condition is met. So until mom gets really, really frustrated with them, they keep dancing. And in this way, I'm hoping that the kids will be able to move up and down the different abstractions of computer science through this bodily kinetic movement all the way through the more abstract syntax-based languages. And very, very importantly, we ought to also give the context of learning. Why am I learning this thing called a loop? Well, because if you make a game, odds are you need a loop. Keep moving the hero until it hits the enemy. And turns out there's this word called computational thinking that encompasses a lot of these concepts, these high-level abstract concepts like algorithm and logical and critical thinking, pattern recognition skills, decomposition skills. But very importantly, it also includes practices, those of persistence, creativity, collaboration, tinkering. And we as software developers know very well that it's not enough to know code. You need to also have these practices of how you code in order to be an efficient and good programmer. The B for my ABC is for Boolean logic. And it touches on the idea that we've kind of flirted around with, the idea of a computer. Because I think computer is one of the most intellectual, uh, like highest intellectual achievements of mankind. It's insane to think about how much knowledge, how many people, how many different industries needed to come together in the past hundreds of years in order to build the modern computer today.
And in some ways, I'm a little bit jealous for those of you who grew up in the 70s and 80s, because you could actually touch a transistor. You had transistor radios you could take apart and understand. For our generation, computer scientists have built layers of abstraction on top of each other to the point where we have these glossy, beautiful devices, the tablets and the phones. But you can also jam 300 million transistors at the pinpoint of a pen. And there's no way of understanding anymore how a computer works. And sometimes I wish I could shrink myself to the size of a silicone chip and fall inside of a computer to learn really how it works. Unfortunately, that's not possible with today's physics, unless you're a children's book author. <laughs> so that's exactly what I did with Ruby. One day Ruby goes to dad's office. She, she's really, really bored. She types her password in, but the computer doesn't work. And all of a sudden, the white mouse it wakes up next to the computer and says, Ruby, I've lost touch with the cursor. Can you help me find the cursor? And Ruby says, of course, I'm the best computer debugger I know of. And together they make themselves really, really small. And just like Alice, they fall deep, deep, deep inside of the computer to the layer of the electricity, where there's billions of tiny switches that only know how to go on and off, on and off. They pass electricity or they don't pass electricity. And Ruby says, I think we could find the cursor here, but it would take forever for us to locate it. So up we must go. And they climb higher where they meet the logic gates that take these bits, these switches that pass electricity or don't pass it, and do a little bit more complicated mathematical operations with them, but still really, really slow to find the cursor over here. So they find the hardware layer of the computer, where there's the processor of the computer, that is really bossy and good at giving instructions for everyone else, but also really forgetful, so it needs help from the RAM and the ROM and the hard drive. And they meet the operating system of the computer, and I won't spoil how, but they do eventually locate the missing uh, cursor. But I think far more importantly, they give this full idea of computers as abstraction machines. They follow how electricity turns into logic, how logic turns into hardware, how hardware turns into software, and how software turns into the apps and games and programs we use on a daily basis. And as a result, they understand that while computers are magical, they are not made of magic. And that's a very profound understanding. While computers are magical, they are not made of magic. They are made of logic. So one of my favorite things to do with kids is ask them to draw what they imagine is inside of a computer. And this is especially interesting because I've asked this from hundreds of kids around the world. And very roughly, you can have these pictures in six different buckets. There's always kids who draw files and apps and games inside of computers, the content creators. There's kids who see the computers as these abstract interlinked networks of information, the future computer architects maybe. There's kids who understand the computer from metaphors. They describe these little characters that operate inside of computers. There's even the gear gurus who imagine that there's tiny gears inside of a computer. Of course, there's no gears inside of a computer, but they grasp something about each component, the smallest component of a computer doing a fairly simple thing and together they've been becoming powerful. And then there's the drafters, the kids who draw the hardware, the electricity, the logic of a computer. And again, understanding that computers, they might have a thousand faces, a thousand forms. And this is the last generation of kids that will remember the computer by the screen and by the keyboard and by the mouse. For the next generation of kids, the computer will be embedded in their toothbrush, in their teddy bear. And it's up to us to kind of update the metaphors and instructions we use to explain what a computer is. So often I do this activity where I ask kids uh, which one of these items is a computer. There's a car, a grocery store, a dog and a toilet. And we discuss how cars are computers because they have navigation systems, how grocery stores have so many different kinds of computers inside of them, from the sliding doors that have a sensor that recognizes someone is coming in, to the ice cream box, to the teller's machine, to the burglar alarms. Dogs are not computers, but a lot of kids talk about robot dogs and how dogs might have microchips inside of them so you can find them if they run away. And then I tell that in Japan, toilets are computers and there's even hackers who hack the toilet. <laughs> this is like the biggest mic drop moment with the kids. Nothing else gets discussed for the rest of the day. 
So we discovered that there's actually hundreds of computers in every single home. And the next activity is one where I give them this little sticker with an on-off button on it. And I tell the children that for this afternoon alone you can make anything in this room into a computer by sticking the sticker on it. And I've collected these everyday items like a book or like a tuna can or stuff like that. And my favorite story is this little girl who comes to me with a bicycle lamp. And she's put the little sticker on the bicycle lamp and she goes, Linda... If this bicycle lamp were a computer, I could go on a biking trip with my father. We could sleep in a tent, and this bicycle lamp, it could also be a movie projector. And that's the moment I think we all are looking for. Not the moment when they understand the difference between hashes and arrays in Ruby or write a perfect JavaScript if-else statement. The moment when they understand free, profound things we adults tend to forget. First of all, the world is not ready. There is so much we haven't invented or discovered yet. Bicycle lamp movie projector being one of them. Second of all, technology is a wonderful way to make the world a little bit better and a little bit more ready because it scales, it creates wealth around it and technology has always been the way humankind has progressed and moved this planet to uh, forward. And then finally, for a moment she felt like she could be the world's first bicycle lamp movie projector innovator. And that kind of self-belief and self-efficacy is, I think, what we should be safeguarding in our children. So how do you explain what a computer is for a generation of kids who won't recognize it in the same terms as we do? In order to do that, we need to go all the way back to year 1945, when John von Neumann came up with his famous von Neumann architecture of a computer. And a little bit simplified, what von Neumann says that it is computer is any device that takes in information, input data, processes that data somehow, and out comes the modified information. This is true when you go on Facebook and you log, uh, like something in goes the information information to the server that someone has liked this post, out comes the updated or modified like count. But this is also true when you sit in a car and you forget to buckle your seatbelt, in goes the sensory information that someone is sitting in the car, out comes the beep 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 noise we all hate so much. And our world is starting to be full of these sensors. Our world is awash with data. And that means these kinds of input process output devices are everywhere around us. And even though Computers look like nothing. Uh, John von Neumann would probably not recognize the computers we have today. The basic operating principle of a computer is still the same. And I would really underline the idea that even more important than teaching kids to code is actually giving them a robust mental model of what a computer is good at and what a human is good at. And that's called the idea of a notional machine, some sort of a mental abstraction of what a computer can and will do and what a human is good at doing. And that brings us to the last letter in the ABC, which is for creativity and computers. Here's the thing, when most people hear the word artificial intelligence, the first image that they conjure in their head is one of Skynet, of Terminator, of a medieval monster that rises from the earth, and they feel frightened, and for a reason. Because AI seems omnipotent, it solves problems in cancer research, it spots uh, criminals from crowds of data, uh, it knows how to optimize I don't know, like uh, sales uh, for apartments. But what people forget is that it's not this like general intelligence we're talking about. It's a very narrow technology applied to different industries. And when I try to explain what AI and machine learning is all about, I start with data. I tell them that every time you click something online, every time you move your cursor online, you're actually generating data. And cities, they collect a ton of data through sensors. And that data can be mangled and worked and, and like generated in different ways. And you shouldn't be afraid of the word data. It's actually something that is really powerful and fun. And that data is nowadays being used to teach machines. We teach machines by giving them examples, and this is called machine learning. And even though it seems like we're giving these abilities to machines that used to belong to us humans, like the ability to see, the ability to move, the ability to communicate, reason, and maybe even to be creative, they are still no closer to the very humanity, the sort of uh, soul that makes us humans than in the 70s. 
what they do is based on data. So in the past, if you wanted to teach a computer if this thing here is a cat, we would write an instruction of, uh, say, a cat is an animal with two ears and a tail, and it comes in brown and black and grey. And these instructions would be very brittle. They would break down easily, and computers were not very good at recognizing cats. So we would give the rules and data, and the computer would come up with answers. Nowadays, instead, what we do is we give the computer lots of examples of cats. Google famously gave the, their neural network like hundreds of thousands of hours of cat videos on YouTube. And the computer comes up with its own rules to recognize cats. And those rules might not have nothing to do with the way we humans recognize cats. And this is much more adaptable, much more um, like better way of, of recognizing cats. So the human asks the question, is this a cat? A computer gives the answer. The human gathers the data, builds a model, and the computer gives an answer. But the thing here is that humans are still needed in this process. We gather the data and we look at the answers, because the thing is the computer doesn't actually give an answer. It gives an estimation. It gives a... Um, prediction or like probability of whether this thing is a cat and we still need humans in order to like check out if this is something that we truly want to automate if this is robust enough of a model uh, to build on and this is where I think a lot of people glaze out they feel like oh AI is this magical black box that I can't uh, work on where there's no future for me and my human skills. But the data gathering and the problem solving, those still require a lot of human skill. And even the building a model part, I hate it when journalists say that we don't know what's happening inside of a computer when um, the neural network is recognizing something. Yes, it's true that we might not understand every single step, but I think it's a disservice we do this in, to this industry by mystifying uh, neural networks. And I always try to explain model building by telling that computers have different strategies uh, for learning about cats. There might be a thing called the reinforcement learning where the computer is given one thing to optimize for and it comes up with creative ways of doing this over and over again, kind of like an evolutionary strategy. And there's supervised learning where you give computers lots of examples, but you've labeled them. So you give it examples of apples and things that are not apples, and it learns through that. And then there's unsupervised learning where you give just computers tons of data and ask it to recognize patterns out of that data. And sometimes with kids, we do, do this neural network exercise where the kids need to look at this neural network and find the different characteristics that apply with the cars and the uh, helicopters and so forth. And I think by mystifying these things, we are making a disservice to the next generation. Because we need different kinds of people, and here's the reason why. The data gathering part. If computers are now learning through examples, through the data we gather, there's a strong... Um, bias and precedence being made here. I show kids these four pictures of cats and I ask them, what is the prejudice or bias a computer might learn if it only learns through these four examples what a cat looks like? And the kids say, hmm, maybe the computer learns that all cats have blue eyes or all cats are grey. And I say, bingo, now draw a picture of a cat that is not grey and doesn't have blue eyes. What about this thing over here? If we're trying to teach a computer to recognize a teacup, what is the misconception a computer might learn out of a teacup? Well, that a teacup always has a handle, that teacups don't come in patterns. Yes, uh, draw like a picture of a teacup with the handle on the left-hand side with flower patterns on it. And these seem like quirky and innocent examples, but as we are automating more and more of the parts of our societies with machine learning and AI, I think it's worth thinking about a future where someone forgets that not all nurses are women, or not all um, all of camera software recognize people with different kinds of eye shapes. And this is where we need a more diverse group of people to get excited about the opportunities of machine learning and to understand that while computers are magical, they are not magic. And this is where the input process output comes in so handy. So when we think about a self-driving car, for instance, the input is the car camera, the process is mapping other cars into uh, like a software or a map, and the output is kind of the ability to drive. Nothing more complex than that, based on data and examples. And I think in this world, it's important for people to understand what we humans are good at, where we excel at, and where computers are far superior.
So with kids, I like to do this activity where we make an art algorithm machine. Because at this point, the kids already know that an algorithm is a step-by-step -step sequence to solve a problem. So an algorithm might be to draw a green circle. An algorithm might be to draw a red triangle each inside of each green circle. An algorithm might be to connect the red triangles with a green line. And I turn this computer on, and in roughly 20 minutes, we've created this beautiful piece of artwork. And I ask the kids, so how long do you think it would take a computer to generate an artwork like this? And there's 10 of the kids, and it took them 20 minutes, so they say one computer, maybe 200 minutes. And I say, no, 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 a computer could do this in a nanosecond. It could probably generate a million of these in a nanosecond because this is exactly the kind of task a computer is good at. It's good at repeating sequences of instructions over and over again faster than any human could ever do. You don't want to compete with a computer on something like this. But how does this artwork make you feel? And a little girl raises her hand. She goes, it makes me feel busy. <laughs> and another one says, it makes me think of last summer and the summer vacation I took with my family in Italy. And I say, this is the thing computers are not very good at doing. Computers don't have memories. Computers can't offer interpretations based on their own experience. Computers are not very emphatic. Computers are not very good at motivating us. Computers don't deal well with new kinds of situations that they don't have data on. And yes, it might be that our kids won't learn to program through the same way as we learn to program, through writing step-by-step -step instructions. Maybe they will do the toothbrushing algorithm in the future by collecting different kinds of examples of toothbrushing. But these very human skills will still remain the same. And it's a long time in the future where we can have the computer like um, overcome all of the different intelligences that we humans possess. And with that in mind, I would like to propose a new kind of pact between AI and humans. I would like to understand AI as one of our best work buddies, like our sidekick, superhero sidekick from the future. And in order to do that, I wanted to ask from a storyteller, how would they see it? So a lot of you know this story from Antoine de saint exupéry like the little prince. And in the book, famously, uh, Antoine draws a picture of a boa snake that has eaten an elephant. And when he shows this picture to adults, all the adults see is a hat. And all the kids see is a boa snake that has eaten an elephant. And Antoine gets really dispirited and he says that these adults, I don't want to talk about them, about exciting things in the world if they only see a hat. I will talk to them about bridge and neckties and politics. And if this is the dynamic between an adult and a child, I was wondering what would be the dynamic between an adult and an AI? And I showed this to the Microsoft Image Vision API and it looks at the photo and it says, I'm not really sure, but I think it's a close-up of a guitar. And I love this. I think this is the future of AI and humans working together, where AI can offer us a different kind of interpretation of the future. Because the future I'm worried about is where we only use machine learning and AI for optimization, efficiency and prediction. I think we unleash the true power of machines and humans when we get people who have nothing to do with machines get excited about programming and computers. So I want to end up with a final example. Armi Ratia is one of the most visionary business leaders of Finland. In the 1960s and 70s, she started the company called Marimekko, which is known for its bold patterns and colors. And Armi said that, oh, Marimekko, it could have equally well been a fun fair or a flower shop. I just wanted to project my own inner world and the way I see the universe through fabric. And I always wondered, what if Armi Ratia lived a little bit later in life? if she was Linus Torvalds, if she used programming and code as a tool of expressing her innate creativity. And a year ago, I got a chance to experiment with this idea. So I was at the Marimekko HQ, and I decided to try out one of these new fancy things called the char RNN, the neural network via things, Andre Karpathy. Um, and I fed to that neural network 1,400 examples of Marimekko clothes names. These are things like Unikko, Tasaraita, Joka Poika. And the idea was that could AI help us come up with new names for, Mar for Marimekko products by recognizing patterns uh, in the body of data, which was not very uh, large at that point. 
And I was really excited about this, again, with the Antoine de saint exupéry example. And I allowed the computer to crunch like numbers for a while. The GPU worked really hard. And then the results were really bad. <laughs> there were things like valos, ilisle, lahnilitanti, onasot, ikkekonigel. And I go like, oh, is this the future of creativity? Like computers coming up with stuff that sounds Estonian or just like gibberish. This was not what I was after. But I figured that, first of all, I hadn't pre-trained the neural network with the Finnish language at all, so I gave it that, and then I, I gave it a little bit more time to crunch these examples. And I go to sleep, and I wake up next morning, and it feels like Christmas and Tamagotchi at the same time. And the results are wonderful. <laughs> They include things like pyynimpakka, tanohaldi, putti, pukukka, tirkka, ruitintulla. And even though you wouldn't speak a word of Finnish, you can see how joyful and happy, kind of Karelian and Eastern, uh, this sound. And I show this to the Marimekko creative team and they go completely white. And then they say, oh my goodness, is AI stealing our job? And I say, no, no, no. The computer generated 3,000 names. We humans are still needed in order to choose the ones that like fit and work but maybe you could see the AI as like a sidekick as someone who can help you with your job instead of taking it away. Finally I think the next big thing won't come out of Silicon Valley. It will come out of the back alleys of China. It will come from uh, Norwegian schoolgirls. It will come from this whole diverse, explosive, creative, colorful world that has not had a chance to see the world of technology in the same eyes as we do. And it's sad because I think the history of computer science is full of these really whimsical and creative and weird people who think about computers in a much larger way than we do today. And when we think about computers, I want to end up with an idea of what happens in a world where we don't have the vocabulary to express the world around us. So this story starts from Oxford University, where researchers were showing kids pictures of natural items and Tamagotchi, uh, of Pokemon species. So they would show pictures of birch trees and uh, plants and animals and then of Pokemon species. And by far, the children were much better at recognizing the Bulbasaur than the Badger. They had more vocabulary to describe Pikachu than the birch tree. And the researchers were worried because what happens to democracy and our understanding and ability to work with the world if we don't have words to describe it. But I would argue the same thing is happening in the world of technology where we have a lot of these suitcase words. These words like algorithm, bitcoin, blockchain. We throw around from one person to another, but we never open up those metaphors. And it requires us as adults to really rethink the way we teach these things, also us in the technology field. I once had a little boy who said to me, Linda, is internet a place? And I go, no, no, internet is not a place. It's this interconnected network of servers around the world. You can think of it as the information superhighway and you go surfing online and it's the cyber world and I realize, oh shit, I sound like a kid of the 90s. <laughs> That was the metaphor for me. This kid He has never disconnected from the online world. So where do I start to even explain to him what the internet is? Is internet the fiber optic cables that go from the bottom of the sea all the way to space? Or is internet the protocols that define how the data that is gathered, gathered around, uh, about us travels around the world eight times in a second? Or would internet be all of the creativity, all of the cat videos and funny memes that happen when the six billion of us are connected to one another? And this is your challenge. Technology is not only about the hardware, it's not only about the software, and it's not only about the societal impact of what happens. It's about all three of these things. And in order to understand the future of technology, I think we need to understand that it's built on humanity. Being a computer used to be a profession, much by being a doctor or a nurse nowadays, for people who were exceedingly good at calculating long series of numbers. And in some ways, I think the last computers in the world will be, again, humans. And the word technology, it comes from Greece, and it's the tools needed to solve a problem. 
but not only the tools, also the skills and competencies and attitudes we humans bring into the problem-solving equation. So while today we think about the technology through a computer, yesterday's technology was the combustion engine, before that it was the bicycle, and we don't know what the future of technology looks like. We only know that we humans will be a part of it. So I want to leave you with a final definition of technology, and it comes from a nine-year-old girl who says, technology is electricity that loves. Technology is electricity that loves. It is used to play. I use it to have a conversation with my mom. We use a WhatsApp application. And then finally, and most importantly, people use technology. Thank you very much. <laughs>